Well, hello and welcome to The Big Picture here on RCTV. This is a show where we talk about sports and we talk about anything I can think of off the top of my head about sports. My name is Kevin Vent. I am the host of The Big Picture and it is a pleasure to be on RCTV with you this evening. I have here my guest. My guest is Jonathan Vent. How are you, Jonathan? I'm doing well. I feel quite well and quite uh, um, at home here. Okay. I, I, I feel that uh, I'm kind of, I am to this show as Alec Baldwin is to SNL. So <laughs> um, it's my third time here and All I right. couldn't be more happy to be Okay, here. well, we'll be charting that, you know, maybe we'll do a, a 40th reunion show in a couple of years. Yeah, or, or, or a comedy skit. Or a um, comedy skit. At halftime, you know, stay tuned. <laughs> All right, good. Well, uh, we do talk about sports and we think sports are supposed to be fun and so we try to talk about some of the more fun aspects of sports and some of the big picture aspects of sports instead of this week's game or next week's game because well, quite frankly, we don't care about that stuff all that much. So we want to talk about uh, the Red Sox a little bit in this episode, and specifically we want to talk about free agency. The Red Sox this winter have been very active on the free agent market, particularly uh, with some, putting some bats in the lineup with the Kung Fu Panda and with Hanley Ramirez, among others. And we wanted to kind of think back and think about some of the best and worst Red Sox free agents of all time. You know, John, I was thinking that the Red Sox didn't really jump into free agency with both feet right away when free agency started in the mid-70s. They kind of crept into it a little bit. In fact, in 1978, uh, after the, or the winter after 1978, after the Red Sox lost the one-game playoff to the Yankees, you know, they decided they needed to retool their team to be able to beat the Yankees the next year. So much they went out and they got Stan Pappy. Yeah. Yeah, Stan <laughs> Pappy. And uh, everyone in Boston was so excited about Stan Pappy's arrival that somebody spray painted on the reverse side of the spray monster, who the bleepity bleep is Stan Pappy. The only ch so the only change they made from 78 to 79. You can use your imagination what word they use. That's right. We can't use that word on family television. But anyway. Um, we'll, so we'll lose all of our sponsors. That's right. We'll lose all of our sponsors. They'll be abandoning us. It'll be awful. And so... Uh, the Red Sox didn't necessarily go for those big name free agents early on. In fact, early on they often used money that people would think they might use on free agents to kind of keep some of the guys they had. Uh, most notably was Jim Rice, who they signed to one of the biggest contracts in baseball history early on after the 78 season to keep him in Boston rather than spending that money on a big name free agent who they, was an unknown quantity to them. But having said that, especially in the recent 15 or 20 years or so, the Red Sox have been somewhat active in free agency. And so we wanted to talk about the best and worst free agents of all time, and Red Sox free agents of all time. And being the cynical Bostonians that we are, we're going to start with the worst Red Sox free agent signings Ooh. of all time. And so I kind of did some research and I was thinking about this and I came up with a list of five. I know you have a couple to add to that mm -hmm. along the way. So here are my, my, my worst Red Sox free agents of all time. And, and my number five worst Red Sox free agent signing of all time was a pitcher, Matt Clement. A <laughs> uh, couple things to remember about Matt Clement as we get going. He was signed to a three-year $26 million contract uh, over the winter of 2004. And for what for that money, the Red Sox, over two seasons, he got injured and didn't pitch the third season, um, got an ERA over five, which is not very good, even no. in the age of the hitter. But the big thing that I remember about Matt Clement and that is, is the person that he replaced on the staff. The person that Matt Clement replaced on the staff was Pedro Martinez. My boy. Yeah, and so you got to think that maybe, even though Pedro wasn't the same Pedro, he would have been better than Clement. Yeah, you got to think so. Um, he uh, he went to I believe to the Mets afterward. Pedro. Pedro went to the Mets. And yeah. uh, he he wasn't he wasn't great. You know he, he he wasn't the Pedro Martinez that we grew accustomed to on the Boston Red Sox. But you know he did better than five ERA and <laughs> yes, you know he did. all that. So um, he he um he he was injury prone, but when he was healthy, he did bring um, some value to the Mets organization. Um, one thing about Matt Clement, I just I feel so sorry for the guy. Yep. I mean, uh, when we first got him, he actually um, had a great start. Uh, he started um, the first half of that first season, um, ten and two. Actually, made the All Star game. Um, you actually have a signed baseball. I by do. Him. I have a Matt so, Clement signed baseball. That's right in my archive. Full collection. disclosure. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, just right after the All Star break, there was know, a story behind that too, but we don't have time to share it today. But. <laughs> Next episode. <laughs> Next episode. Um, in, in the fortieth uh, reunion. In the fortieth yeah. reunion, we'll talk about. Um, that. <laughs> but I'm um, right after that All Star game. That's when he got beamed on the head. He was never the, ever the same player. Yeah. After yeah. That. And whether it was nerves or what have you, we don't know. But the, what we do know is that he did not perform 
for the Red Sox, and that makes him, a, regardless of the reason, that's what makes him a bad free agent signing. Yeah. My number four worst free agent signing of all time is kind of a little before your memories what? of the Red Sox. I mean, you were alive, but you just don't remember it a whole lot. And he's a, another pitcher uh, by the name of Matt Young. The Red Sox signed Matt Young in 1991 for the 1991 season, signed him to a two-year contract for, at that time, it was really big money, five million bucks over two years. And he only lasted one year as a starter. Uh, again, had a plus five ERA over two years coming out of the bullpen in his second year as a Red Sox. And again, uh, with that plus five ERA, he is unique, well, not unique, but he is re remembered for one particular event uh, that occurred. And that was, he pitched no hitter for the Red Sox early on in the 91 season, but it was a no hitter that he lost. <laughs> Now, how could he lose a no-hitter? It's because he walked like 12 guys in that game <laughs> and walked in like three runs or something like that. Yeah. And so he ended up pitching a no-hitter that he lost. And he was kind of the poster child at that time for bad Red Sox free agent signings. Everybody, when they talked about bad Red Sox free agent signings, they talked about Matt Young yeah. as, as, kind of, as, as, as kind of the poster child of that. So I, I know you don't, if you have anything to yeah, about I, Matt I Young. Yeah, was, I was alive. I was 11 years old uh, <laughs> in Little League. Um, so I was, I was just pretty much trying to make a name for myself, you know, oh, yeah, just yeah. Uh, pitching in the in triple a you know <laughs> um, try to make a name for myself in salem new hampshire you know <laughs> so that's uh, i i just knew mike greenwell back then mike, uh, mike greenwell okay well the next the next uh, of the worst free agent signings of all time mm -hmm. is also one from that same uh, roughly the same, little after that time period who, who you may remember and the number three worst free agent signing that i have for the red sox was andre dawson now andre dawson was and is a hall of fame player so let's not forget that okay but as the Red Sox are prone to do in those days, they tended to bring on big name sluggers at the tail end of their careers after their heyday had gone by. And again, Andre Dawson is kind of the poster child for that. He had had up to that point with the Cubs and the Expos before that a Hall of Fame career. Um, then he got to the Red Sox and the Red Sox paid him, a, gave him a two year contract for $10 million, which in today's equivalent would be like giving him a two-year contract for 25 or 30 million. I mean, that's to kind of put it into, into context a Good little bit. Good chunk of change. Good chunk of change in those days mm -hmm. in the mid-90s. And for his two years on the Red Sox uniform, he gave them a grand total of 29 home runs, 14 of which were in his first season, nine of which were in her second season with the Red Sox. Quick, do the math. How many home runs per million dollars spent? <laughs> uh, I don't know, but what I can tell you is that I believe the Red Sox spent ninety thousand dollars per hit on him for, for Andre Dawson or something wow. like that over the, over that couple year period. So, I mean, th that's just gives you an idea of, of of where they were at in those times, and, and because of that, he was just another in a long list of free agent busts that the Red Sox signed in those days. And there are other players we could put in that list. Um, to a lesser extent, Jose Canseco, but I was thinking of Kevin Mitchell is in that list. I was thinking of Tom Bernanski in that list. I mean, there's just a list, this list of sluggers they would get yeah. that were just no good. They were just no good. And when they got here, they had been good before they got here, and they were terrible. The Red Sox were, were lusting after power in the mid-'90s because they couldn't produce any of their own until Mo Vaughn came along. Mo. 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 <laughs> we're going to talk about Mo in a little bit with one of our other, with one yeah, of our yeah. other uh, uh, choices here. The number two worst free agent of all time is a fairly recent one, and one I know you have something to say about. And in my mind, it's Carl Crawford. Mm. Carl Crawford was signed to a seven-year, 140, yes, I said that correctly, seven-year, $140 million deal. He was with the Red Sox for about a season and a half, a little more than a season and a half, even though he was on a seven-year contract. The best of my knowledge, the Red Sox are still paying him, though he plays for the Dodgers, at least part of that. And... Uh, he gave them a total of a 260 batting average and drum roll 14 home runs over one and a half seasons for <laughs> Carl Crawford with the Red Sox. That's what they got for their 30 or 40 million bucks that they paid him while he was on the payroll. Yeah. Any thoughts on Carl Crawford? I just uh, what a what a disappointment. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm, we used to draft him really high in our fantasy leagues. Yes, we did. <laughs> um, you know, he, he was like he was a guy that would get you know he 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 would always you know hit for. Uh, average and he would he would get the stolen bases and he was just all around you know good fielder just all around great player he was always a good pick on fantasy I mean uh, we, he's a we, career 290 hitter so yeah you know. I mean he was he was he was great he was great and then uh, it was just really disappointing how things turned out in Boston yeah uh, it, it was him. it was almost as though he didn't what, he signed the big contract because he was kind of wowed by the dollars and when he got here he realized he didn't want to play in Boston 
He didn't want to be here. It was too much for him. The press of the crowd or the, 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 or the press of the press, you know, or whatever. Everything that, that, that goes in playing in Boston was almost too much for him. And, he, and he, he tried to live up to his contract. I think he's an honest guy. And he just couldn't do it. He, just, he was trying too hard almost. Yeah. And, uh, and I think and, and the injury bug got him and has followed him into L.A. as well. He just hasn't, since that point, has never lived up to that contract that the Red Sox gave Yeah, him. I must admit, I was excited when we, when we signed up. I was too. I, mean, I thought, you know, for two reasons. One is he was, at that point, considered the best free agent on the market and the Yankees were really interested in him. Of course, part of me wishes the Yankees had signed him now <laughs> at this point because now they'd be tied with that albatross around their neck as well. But <laughs> be that as it may, um, at the time, he was the, he was the, he was the, the free agent pickup of, the, of that summer. Yeah, and it, it's, it's, it's too bad the way that worked out. But it's just an, an example of a, a big market team throwing dollars around at someone that really didn't deserve it. And not to mention, uh, uh, during that same time period, we got Adrian Gonzalez. Um, yep. Not through free agency, but you know, we added him through a trade, right? Yeah, Am through a trade with San Diego. So, yeah. like, you know, that was within weeks of each other, if yep. I'm not mistaken. Um, so we, we just really added a lot, you know, two big powerhouses. And if you remember that 2011 season that they came on board, I mean, at the beginning of that season, we were calling them the best team ever assembled, <laughs> you know, because you still had Pedroia and you had Ortiz. And, I mean, this was just a powerful, it was Gonzalez and Crawford and, and, and Ellsbury in center field. And he had, remember that year, you had Andre Ethier, not Andre Ethier, you had uh, – um, uh, third base. Yeah, uh, Beltre. Adrian, Be- Adrian Beltre at third base. And we were calling that the best team ever assembled. Yeah. And, you know, for the for the first couple of weeks of the season, they were horrible. And they picked up in May, and they played like gangbusters from May through June, July, and August. And they hit the wall in September, and it completely fell apart on them. Amazing. And it was just un- it was an unbelievable season in that way. Um, and part of it, quite honestly, was Carl Crawford's fault. He did not live up to the to the hype in, in, at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I have him number two. He would have been number one on this list if the Red Sox uh, still had him under contract with them, you know, and they were still paying. I mean, they probably are still paying him some now, but but if they were still saddled by him, you know, he would probably be number one on this list. But because they were able to trade him to the Dodgers, um, is is why he's not number one. So just to recap some of mine, I had uh, Matt Clement, Matt Young, Andre Darson, uh, Carl Crawford. We're going to do a couple honorable mentions before we talk about the number one. I know you have a couple of those in there. One of my honorable mentions is Jack Clark from way back in the early 90s who, who was a, a, like a 220 hitter for the Red Sox and another guy who came in and everyone thought was going to be great and kind of blew it. I know you have a couple there. Yeah, uh, I have to go with um, a big uh, Dan Duquette signing. Okay. <laughs> you know, our old buddy Dan Duquette. Um, I, I have to go with Steve Avery. Steve Avery. Um, you know, he had a couple seasons, I, I guess six seasons with the Atlanta Braves yep. before. And, and you, as you remember, um, through the early to mid-90s, um, that Braves pitching staff, you know, you, you, um, you Steve Avery, you had, you had Maddox, had Smoltz, and Maddox, and Glavin. Uh, Glavin. Um, and he, he rounded out the rotation um, being the fourth pitcher. Right. So, I mean, being the fourth pitcher on that staff, not too bad. Okay? Right. <laughs> but I will say his first three um, – his first three seasons for Atlanta, he was he was great. Um, he mm-hmm. could have been an ace anywhere else. Right. Um, the problem is the remaining three seasons that he had on the Braves weren't weren't so great. He he was kind of on the at the twilight of his career. <laughs> now, as you Red Sox fans remember, that's what Dan Duquette said about Roger Clemens. Right. Um, when when Roger Clemens' uh, right. contract was up, he thought that he was um, Clemens was at the twilight of his career, and you know what happened after that? He went on to Toronto and had. Two yeah. tremendous Cy Young type seasons, yeah. and, and regardless of how he may have done that, the right. fact of the matter is, is he did do it. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, so the problem with Steve Avery is that I don't know if um, everyone remembers correctly, but um, Steve Avery came in the year after Roger Clemens left, and the year before Pedro Martinez came in. So right. there's that one year that he came in, and he was supposed to be the ace. Right. Um, he was he, really the Roger Clemens replacement right. in, on the Red Sox. He made a ton of money. He was the second uh, most highest paid on the Red Sox that year behind Mo Vaughn. Mo. So we told you Mo Vaughn would be coming back. <laughs> Good prediction. Good prediction. <laughs> we have a... We Ooh, have a, yeah. the great Karnak remembers. <laughs> um, so when he came to the Red Sox, you know, he posted a post five, uh, five ERA. Yeah. He walked more batters than he struck out. Complete disappointment. And the, um, and the other thing with him, remember, is, is, is that uh, Kevin Kennedy, who was the manager of the Red Sox at that time, uh, decided to pitch him in like the third or the second last game of the season or something like that. And that caused a clause in his contract to kick in that 
caused the Red Sox to have to pick him up for another season yeah. uh, when he was done, which means basically Kevin Kennedy gave him an extra seven or eight million bucks that they could have spent on something else, but they had to give it to Avery because he pitched the, the innings total, gave him the number of innings. His contract had a clause that said if he pitched X number of innings, I don't remember what it was, then yeah. he he was picked up for the next year and he needed that last start to do it yeah I, I i do believe he only averaged a little bit over 100 innings pitched for a season something like that which is yeah. you know inexcusable for a starting pitcher especially, especially when there's an ace especially if you're the ace you know Absolutely. you expect to get a minimum of 200 220 230 out of an ace um you know to really be that workhorse on your staff and, yeah. and he just he never lived up to that yeah and he he eventually you know fell out of favor and got injured and right Another honorable mention uh, we had beyond Steve Avery is, is another replacement player, per se, when Mo Vaughn left to sign with the California Angels, or the Anaheim Angels, or the California Angels of Anaheim, or the Los Angeles <laughs> Angels of Anaheim, or whoever they are. Angels in the outfield. The Angels in the outfield, whoever they are. Um, the big free agent signing that winter for the Red Sox was the man who was going to take the mantle from Mo Vaughn and lead the Red Sox onto glory, Jose Offerman. <laughs> what? You don't remember him? Not surprising. <laughs> he was a light-hitting second baseman shortstop type who they decided to play at first base, figuring they could replace Mo Vaughn's 40 home runs a year with Jose Offerman's five or six home runs a year, and that he, his speed and his grittiness would really take over and would, it would win us over. Yeah, not so much. Bad free agent signing. Again, low batting average, didn't really do much. He, he, he wore cool shades, though. He did have great shades. <laughs> that, 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 excellent point by you. Excellent point by and you. And I believe one of the years he led the league in triples. Okay. All right. He led the league. Had, had nine or something like that. One nine year. triples. Okay. Yeah. Well, you put that in comparison. That was awesome. Jim Rice, big doofy power hitter, right? Hit 15 triples in 1978, <laughs> his MVP year. I just point that out to you. I don't know why that's a stat I remember off the top of my head, but it absolutely is. It's impressive. It's very impressive. Yeah. Triples are yeah. amazing. The other bad free agent signings, I'm lumping a couple of them together in our honorable mentions here, not in the top five necessarily, but in our honorable mentions. Um, two men that were brought in to, to replace the hole left by a certain Nomar Garcia Para after he was traded. Um, then you remember Orlando Cabrera came in for the yep. end of that 2004 season when they won the World Series. And then they went to the free agent market to get the best shortstop available. And there were two of them that, in the course of a couple of years that they brought in. The first one was the guy who had played on the other side of the field with, from them in the World Series. Edgar Renteria, who lasted a year and couldn't field a stick on the field. <laughs> Anytime, if the ball was on the ground, he couldn't field it. He I was believe he ended up with 30 errors that season. 30 errors. He had a decent batting average, 279 or something like yeah. that. But the Red Sox did sign him for a four-year, $36 million contract. Mm -hmm. Well, they got rid of him, and they said, no, 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 that was a little bit of a mistake. We apologize. We're going to bring in another guy, Julio Lugo, for another four-year, $36 million contract, who played actually three years for the Red Sox. That kind of surprised me that uh, he was there, but he did get traded, I think, mid through that third season. Couldn't hit his way out of a paper bag, Julio Lugo, while he was here. Yeah, um, absolutely not. And he, he also wasn't uh, too pristine with the glove. No, well. no, he wasn't. And so what you had a situation there was where the Red Sox were paying shortstops all over baseball um, <laughs> during that time period. And in fact, when they played the Colorado Rockies in the World Series in 2007, they were paying Julio Lugo the Rockies' third baseman, to play. <laughs> they were paying his salary that's, while he was playing for the other team. That's when you know it's a bad sign. That's when you know it's a bad sign. you're signing. in the World Series and you're paying the opposition's salary. Yes. <laughs> wow. So anyway, and then I had one more on the honorable mention list. I don't know if you yeah, had Yeah, I had a more. few pitchers. Okay, um, let's uh, go. I had Ramiro Mendoza. Oh, Ramiro Mendoza, um, you know, the, as the ultimate traitor or, or double agent. The, the or double agent. We used to call him the double agent <laughs> because here he came from the Yankees. He won four World Series with the Yankees. As a setup guy for... Uh, for uh, uh, Mariano Mario Rivera, Rivera yep. yeah. Um, and he did well over there. But once we signed him, he his ERA ballooned to 6.75 uh, for the season, and he completely just fell apart. That's why he had the reputation of being uh, the double agent. Double agent. Now I don't know. I don't know why he was signed. I know that there was a need for relief pitching uh, right. back then. But I mean, just because the guy's a champion, you don't go signing, you know, someone go offer him a bunch of money right. uh, to do. I mean, I, it kind of reminds me of the Celtics when they signed Randy Brown from the <laughs> Chicago Bulls from the '90s. Right. They're like, "Oh, this oh, guy he has a won a championship. Let's make him a co-captain." <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, you know, so I mean, a lot of good decisions were made in 2003 when they signed Mendoza, but right. this one was a misfire. Right, right, right. Um, uh, the this one, I hate to say it because I love the guy, is uh, Julian Tavares. Julian Tavares, the sweatiest now, man in baseball. Yeah. Um, again, um, this guy pitched for the Cardinals when we uh, were in the World Series um, with them. And uh, he actually... <laughs> that was freaky. <laughs> <laughs> Tavares? <laughs> it's the ghost of Julian <laughs> Tavares. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, he, he was not the same pitcher as he was when right. he was with the Cardinals. I mean, 
He, uh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. I'm, I'm starting to talk well about him. Now yeah. the lights go back on. Um, <laughs> when he was with the Cardinals, he, he was stellar. Like he, he pitched, you know, like really like ERA is round three. Really he, solid he, pitcher. He was one of the reasons they made the World Series. In yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and um, but once he came to the Red Sox, he just got worse and worse and worse um, from an ERA uh, standpoint. However, I cannot just say that he was a bad signing because I loved watching the guy. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but um, it seems like whenever he would draw a foul ball, he would be like directing the whole infield, <laughs> like like Keith Walker and the Boston Pops. He'd be like, "You go there, and you go there." And ta -da! Ta -da! <laughs> it was great to watch. And he did sweat a lot. Don't forget that. Yeah. He, he'd be sitting on the bench. He'd be sweating through his cap already. He was, a and then you'd watch him pitch, and you could see the brim of his cap. You could see the sweat dripping from the brim of his cap when he was he was pitching. Yeah. Um, and then you know another one we haven't really talked about, and, and I'm kind of hesitant to put him on the bad signing list because I'm not a, a, a I'm not a a real critic of this guy, but a lot of people talk about J.D. Drew mm -hmm. as being someone who, who is kind of a bad signing. I, I kind of am more inclined to say he, he was what he was. They knew what he was, but they signed him to a bigger contract than they should have signed him to. But that's the Red Sox fault. I mean, we are talking about bad for agent signing, so I guess that is a bad signing in that sense, is they signed him to a contract bigger than he was worth. Mm -hmm. um, especially, uh, especially during the regular season. During the regular season. Now, as yeah. we all know, you know, we paid, grand slam. Yeah, we paid him fourteen million dollars um, when he came in, and right. uh, and he actually came through in the in the postseason in the AC, um, ALCS. ALCS yeah. He had that grand slam, so people call that the fourteen million dollar grand slam. Right. So <laughs> I mean, how much is the championship worth to you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was a decent defensive player, and actually a very good defensive player in right field when he played. One of the critiques of him was how injured he injured <laughs> he seemed to be all the time, and you know he would get a hangnail and had to be up for four days and that kind of thing, but. Uh, you know, in the long run, I, I don't think he was a horrible signing, and, and I don't. I guess I don't blame him for for, for, for what he became. He was he did what, here what he did every other place he had been. It's just that the Red Sox playing out overpaid him. Yeah, and and, and I guess you got to throw that in. Um, I also had Tony Clark on my list as a you know big doofy first baseman guy who brought in another one in the long list of power hitters that couldn't hit for here for whatever reason. Well, that brings us to the worst Red Sox free agent signing of all time, in my opinion. My number one worst free agent signing. For those of you who are big Red Sox fans out there, you probably guess who it is because we haven't brought him up yet. <laughs> um, and that's intentional, obviously. The number one worst free agent signing of all time is, drum roll please, Daisuke Matsuzaka. <laughs> that's right. Daisuke Matsuzaka, the gyro ball. <laughs> G G gyro ball. And part of the reason is, quite honestly, the amount of money that they paid. Not only did they give Daisuke a six-year, $51 million contract, but they also had to pay a $50 million, that's $50, $50 million <laughs> posting fee just to negotiate with him, to the team that he played for in Japan. So you put that together, and they essentially gave him $101 million over six years, of which he only pitched three or four for the Red Sox. He was injured one. It just was a horrible deal in the yeah. long run. He, he, got, he did have 18 wins in his first season, and that looks really good on paper. Until you, But if you remember the way he was, you realize that he wasn't 18 wins good. He, he, he constantly was pitching into trouble, constantly loading the bases and pitching mm -hmm. his way out of it. Horrible couldn't, whip. Horrible whip, which is the walks and hits for innings pitched. Um, couldn't get his, good get, couldn't uh, um, get a clean inning. Never pitched beyond the fifth inning, it seemed like. He was always, was always in trouble with lots of pitches. And then would, would complain when they pulled him after 120 pitches in five innings, saying he could go 200 pitches. Well, no pitcher does that anymore. <laughs> and just never really adapted to the American game. Is yeah. really what it came down to. Absolutely, I completely agree, 100%. But I do know that he probably made the Red Sox a lot of money for uh, for his, uh, um, you know, for selling jerseys. <laughs> you know, and so he he it's created great. and opened up a market absolutely for the Red Sox. So he probably, in that sense, made the hundred million bucks back that they paid. Uh, so from a business sense, it was probably a good idea. But from a on the field mm -hmm. point of view, I consider it to be the worst free agent signing of all time. And a lot of it has to do with the amount of money. Just an absurd amount of money to pay for a guy who just plain didn't pan out and wasn't that good when he got here. Right. You know, they signed him primarily on the scouting they got from the World Baseball Classic, which he was spectacular in, and, and in Japan. And it's just another proof to us that the Japanese game isn't as tough as the American game. As good as the players look, mm -hmm. they, you know, a lot of them just don't pan out. And, and Dice K was one of them. He was a great pitcher in Japan and couldn't, couldn't hack it here. Right. All right, well, those are the worst Red Sox free agent signings of all time. And don't worry, we're going to end on a positive note towards the end of the show. But we are going to take a little bit of a break here and uh, get, have a few announcements from some of our friends. 
This is The Big Picture. You're watching it on RCTV. We'll be back in just a moment. Well, welcome back here to The Big Picture on RCTV. I continue to be your host, Kevin Vent. This continues to be my uh, guest, Jonathan Vent. And apparently the technical staff here at RCTV told me that we went way too long in the first segment. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not able to do the second segment in this episode. So we're going to do that in another episode. So uh, we have lots to say about the best free agent signings, but maybe just wrapping up the worst free agent signings. Just any thoughts on, on why the Red Sox had so many bad ones? Oh, I, I mean, you know, it all, it all comes to um, a dice roll. Uh, ah. a, a dice oh, cake. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> I told you SNL was coming back. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a crapshoot, you know, yeah. when you, when you uh, sign a free agent. Um, you know, as the, the new free agents that they signed this year, you know, no one, no one knows what they're going to do or what right. they're really capable of doing over an extended period of time. Right. Um, you know, you just win some and, and you lose some. Right. And so and the ones we talked about in episode, this episode are the ones that they lost. All right. In our next episode, we'll be talking about the places where the Red Sox won and actually signed some excellent free agents. And a couple of them were actually, in my opinion, one of them is the best free agent signing possibly in baseball history. So we're going to do that in our next episode. I'd like to thank you for watching and don't be too depressed. In fact, why don't you look for the next episode at some point soon because it'll be much more uplifting and exciting than this one. <laughs> this has been the, the Big Picture on RCTV. I am your host, Kevin Vent. Have a good evening.